All right, it's nice to see so many fans of government modernization out here on day one of reInvent. Um, well, I guess sort of day two if you went to Midnight Madness. Um, so uh, I'm Trisha Davis Muffet, and I lead uh, global public sector marketing for AWS. Um, and this is my fifth reInvent, and I'm very excited to see it grow like it has and um, to see so many folks from the public sector show up. Uh, I do just want to uh, invite any of you who would like to join us to come to the public sector reception that we're having on Wednesday evening. We have cards at the back of the room, so um, please see one of our AWS folks if you'd like to pick one up. Um, so uh, as public sector organizations have, uh, have moved to the cloud, we're seeing lots of really interesting trends and um, you know, we have some of the real trailblazers and innovators here with us today. So I'm very excited for you to hear from them. Um, I'll just quickly tell you who we have here. Um, and then I will, hmm, let's see. Maybe I'll show you their pictures, maybe I won't. Uh, and then, uh, I don't know. Um, well, we'll see if they go on the slide or not. <laughs> That's okay. Um, but uh, we have with us today um, Peter Quack from the, uh, the CIO of the Land Transport Authority, all the way from Singapore. Uh, Diptesh Patel, Deputy Director of the Department of Work and Pensions, the UK government. Um, Jennifer Schaefer, the VP of Information Technology and CIO at Athabasca University in Canada. And Jean-Marie Simonin uh, from the Cloud and Streaming Team Manager from Radio France. So we have sort of the whole world represented here. Um, so first off, I would like to um, have each of you just uh, tell us a little bit about what's been going on in your organizations very quickly before we go on with the questions. Jennifer? Great, so thank you everybody for being here. Very excited to uh, be representing Canada and uh, specifically Western Canada and Alberta where Athabasca University headquarters are. But we are Canada's only 100% digital, online and open university. We were founded in 1970 as uh, the first North American open distance education university. And in 1995, we were the first uh, institution in the world to put the MBA, MBA online, the uh, Master's in Business Administration. So we're reinventing ourselves again now in 2018 with AWS and uh, we've gone all in. I'll be excited to tell you more about what we're doing for uh, training for all of our employees, technical staff, operational staff, our tutors, our professors, our communities and how we're, uh, through training, then driving innovation into all of our learning products and our offerings as we move from a university that has about 40,000 folks taking everything from single courses to online PhDs. Uh, we're in every province in Canada. We're also across uh, 87 countries. We've got students uh, that are taking our courses. And, um, we're an accredited institution, so we really like the idea of being able to scale from the 40,000 we're at now to a million plus. And there's no reason we can't do that with AWS, and we're really excited to uh, talk some more about it. Thanks. Okay. Diptesh? Hi, Diptesh Patel. Um, fantastic to be here to share our experiences uh, from DWP. So the Department of Work and Pensions, um, one of uh, the largest public sector organizations in the, uh, in the UK, federal department, um, we serve 22 million citizens uh, delivering a number of services uh, to provide state pension um, services, working age benefits, illness and disability. So really core mission, really critical mission, serving our, our citizens, our customers, um, around uh, their access to, to, those, uh, to those benefits. We make something like half a billion pounds of payments every day, so our services are really, really critical to, to citizens. Um, We've done a huge amount on transforming our, uh, our what we describe as hybrid cloud, um, exiting a number of uh, monolithic contracts and transforming um, our services to use public hyperscale pr uh, cloud um, at, at scale. Um, looking forward to sharing some of our experiences and some of the things we've learned. We've learned quite a lot over the last uh, couple of years around how we can accelerate at enterprise scale, but also um, around some of the cultural aspects as well, around how we've uh, taken that approach in, in what's not a traditionally greenfield environment. We've got services um, 
and uh, colleagues that have been there for, for, for some time, some very talented colleagues, and um, sharing how we've um, made that journey and, and moved, moved along that journey to deliver some um, amazing services. Jean-Marie? Hi, uh, I'm going to speak in French, and I've, I have my translator today. Exactly. So, bonjour, je m'appelle Jean-Marie, je suis le responsable des infrastructures cloud chez Radio France. Radio France, euh, c'est une entreprise qui existe depuis 60 ans et qui est spécialisée dans les médias, donc l'information, la culture euh, et la mise à disposition du grand public de tous les savoirs. So, uh, my name is Alexis, I work at IWS in France with Jean-Marie. I'm going to translate what he says today. So, Radio France is the biggest uh, French group, radio group uh, in France. It has more than seven brands for the last 60 years of, um, of living. They deliver uh, music and news and uh, all of kind of radio services all around France. And this, um, and Jean-Marie is the CTO of Radio France. Radio France s'est transformée depuis cinq ans. Uh, elle était une radio exclusivement parlée. Elle est devenue une radio digitale. So for the last five years, uh, there, there has been a huge uh, migration and transformation within Radio France because they switched from a um, streaming uh, sound to um, video and more rich content. Notre uh, stack uh, a été fait sur Kubernetes, sur Amazon, et uh, nous a permis de développer toutes les applications uh, qui nous permettent de, de, de numériser, de mettre à disposition en digital nos contenus. So the whole stack is 100% Kubernetes running on AWS, and it helps them deliver the content to everybody in France uh, more quickly and to deliver new features uh, every day to the, to the customer and the listener in France. Un grand chantier de transformation d'une vieille entreprise française, donc qui a du mal à changer et qu'on accompagne depuis cinq ans et on y arrive. So it's a French old lady switching completely to digital, which is a, a very uh, long work and project. Great, thank you. And Peter? Yeah. <coughs> thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm Peter from Lens Transport Authority of Singapore. Um, just very quick, Singapore is a very like, uh, small city in the urban area. Uh, population about 5.5 million people. In the land area, about 250 square miles. So it's very compact and dense. Um, very open economy, high per capita GDP, and also a very major sea and air hub in Asia and to extend to the world. So my organization, Land Transport Authority, is uh, in charge of looking at how to keep the world moving for Singaporeans. So we do two key functions. The first is to work out short-term, mid-term, and long-term transport master plan for Singapore. And second is to regulate and provide land transport services in rear, the bus, the road, um, moving the people day to day in, in, from the origin to destination. Um, we have various challenges. We are doing well, but we have challenges. Two key challenges I will just really highlight as an organization. The first is to ensure there is a reliable and efficient uh, land transport operation to bring people around the city. And, and at the, at the extent, uh, immediate extent, uh, data is very important for us to be able to bring it to the people. Um, second one is to, need to be able to um, sustain as well as to embrace the change, disruption caused by technology, innovation, um, even smaller changes. For example, um, e-commerce has uh, drastically changed the, the way urban logistics is done. Uh, right hailing app has actually changed the way uh, and disrupt the taxi industry. So um, to address these challenges, one of the efforts we are doing is really about um, coming out with digital transformation plan um, at the organization, organization level. And having a very clear and uh, robust cloud strategy is very important in enabling to this. Uh, I'll just share one um, quickly a project we are doing. Um, we have a land transport op operation center. This center is a 724 command control center in a room that people are amending and they are looking at how we can sustain the health of the land transport operation. So when the congestion, when the disruption, we are able to respond very quickly. And to do that, we need a lot of data. So we put a lot of sensors in buses, in a train, in a, in a real, uh, real station. And these are packed in real time back to the command center. So we're talking about perhaps like two billion uh, in depending on the data um, we are collecting uh, from all these sensors. And we are making use of the cloud technology to be able to ingest, analyze, compute, and pass back to the, to the sensor so that we can be able to have very good situation awareness and take preventive uh, measures. So I'll share more as we go along with this. Yep, Thank you of very course. Much. Yeah. 
Uh, Ditesh, let's start with you. Sure. Um, on the, the, I know you've been on a, a long journey or a, a, you know, a journey on, the, on your move to the cloud. Um, tell me what one of the most important things is that you have done that has um, helped your transformation. Um, it sounds a bit like a cliche, actually, but um, it is that, that engagement, and it's probably the executive support. Mm -hmm. um, we hear it a lot, but I think that um, certainly my experience is getting that, that executive support from our CTO and our CIO, helping to, to really push those boundaries and to transform has been a, a massive difference. Um, again, cultures of organization, public sector does have that connotation of it's slow to change, mm -hmm. um, that it does take time. And having that executive support and that buy-in, having that engagement with, uh, with, with colleagues across um, our applications teams and, uh, and across the organization has made a real difference to help in to transform at scale. Um, and with, We've achieved a lot over the last um, few uh, few years. I think our main objective is really standardizing our, sh our services, creating that shared services platform so that we can have our digital application teams come and start to reuse those services to be able to just concentrate on delivering those services. And that's taken some time working with uh, different stakeholders across the organization, but that's been um, probably the most key thing is getting that, that real push and that drive to say, we can do this. Um, and we're one of probably largest now um, consumers of hyperscale cloud within the UK government, mm -hmm. which, is, which is fantastic. We're, we're really pushing ahead. And I know that your, your citizens are you know, demanding a, a modernized infrastructure, right? Have, has there been an impact on engagement with, um, with the public or with citizens? I mean, we're, we're always innovating um, at the moment. We're, working our CTO's innovation dojo is looking at how we can start to look at other services and mm -hmm. um, start to innovate to perhaps use an, an Echo Dot to be able to talk to mm -hmm. us and interact with us. Mm -hmm. um, being able to deliver reliable, secure services is core to our, uh, to our mission. So the, the work we do is really critical mm -hmm. um, and the services we deliver. So that's the prime, the yep. prime kind of uh, the key benefit that we are bringing by removing those, those legacy systems and legacy infrastructure and moving to new reliable infrastructure and improving, um, improving performance. Mm -hmm. We've had a number of services move across over the last um, few, few months, in, in fact, a large transformation in the last six months. Um, we've had some fantastic um, uh, feedback from citizens. Um, the time to actually deliver and to be able to respond on applications. But also, just to step back a little bit, it's not just about the technology, it's about re-architecting, refactoring these applications mm -hmm. so we can actually improve them. So some of them may have been there for some years. What can we do to modernize those, take new user needs and requirements, and start to deliver that, that different change? So yeah. we're, it's, we're looking at above the technology and looking at the whole business benefits around what we could do to improve that system experience. Yeah. Um, Peter, I know that uh, a lot of what you're working on is really related to better engagement with your citizens, right? Mm -hmm. So if you could talk a little bit about that, about how, how the change in technology has, um, has made a difference in your engagement with citizens. Yes. In a way, we also receive quite a lot of feedback from citizens on how can the land transport be better um, organized and, and, and service delivery. So we receive about a million feedback from different sources. And, um, and every year, I think we have, a, we have a counter that serves a citizen, and about half a million people come and carry out a different transaction. So one of the things we're trying to do is really to move the citizen a lot more to online, as well as to, um, um, to provide information. Because one of the feedback that come from the citizen is that can they know more information? Information about, for example, traffic condition, uh, 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 train disruption, bus arrival. So what we've done a few things. The first is really, a of my transport apps that we, we, we ingest all the data set and bring this data back to the, to, the, to, the, to the public. So this app is currently, we have quite a good download, about 3.7 million downloads, considered population size about 5 million, and every day about uh, 100,000 to 100,000 people using the app. And when there's a disruption, for example, there's a major incident or there's a train disruption, we find that that number will go up five times or 10 times. So in order to be able to scale up and down very quickly, we actually make use of the cloud, uh, AWS our partner, to help us to be able to scale up quickly. And um, the other aspect is also about digital services. We want to achieve an end-to-end -end digital service in the sense that the customer don't have to come to um, counter to carry out the services. In fact, 100% of services should be able to done online 
whether it is a transfer for vehicle ownership, renewing root tax. So these are in a pipeline to, to make sure that these can be um, fully uh, digital and online um, and made available to the citizen. That's great. Yeah, and, and so Jean-Marie, I know that when we spoke earlier, you said that you're um, a driving force in the transformation for Radio France was the demands of your listeners and citizens. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how the technology shift has helped to transform your organization and be more responsive to your consumers? Um, la radio, uh, RTN, l'ancien média radio, est consommé à hauteur de 86% à l'instant où je vous parle. So 86% of radio worldwide at when we speak is RTN. Uh, the the Ertian cons consumption is a, a, around uh, 86 percent okay. now in France. Ah, in France, not in worldwide. Sorry. In France, je vais switch en français. Oui, uh, <laughs> uh, depuis uh, depuis 15 ans, uh, les web radios, uh, les médias numériques avancent gentiment. Il y a 5 ans, c'était 4 percent de nos consommations uh, numériques so. par rapport au Ertian. So for the last 15 years, there has been a progression, a small and, and, and slow progression of uh, digital media uh, compared to the urgent, um, the old way of consuming radio. La force de notre approche a été de mettre à disposition des chaînes un produit numérique. So they switched and they, they created brands and programs that are fully numerical for people to consume it in the new digital era. Pour la pour pour la chaîne, un produit numérique c'est un accompagnement marketing SEO, un accompagnement euh, technique et un accompagnement d'infrastructure. So the way they see it is that every brand has its own infrastructure, its own products and its own digital marketing which makes it uh, a, a full product by brand. Ce qui nous a on, on, Et on a euh, accompagné les chaînes, les, les journalistes, euh, à publier, à savoir écrire. C'était des gens qui autrefois parlaient, et on les a accompagnés dans l'écriture, et en leur mettant à disposition des back office qui soient suffisamment euh, simples. So there has been a huge switch because journalists in Radio France used to talk to the radio, and when you switch digital, you also have to write. So they had to help them um, switch from the old phase to, to the old state from the new one, and they did it by technology, providing backend and, and, and content management system that are really easy to use and that can help them in the switch of their, of their job. Mais il y a quatre ans, on n'était pas sur AWS. <laughs> Four years ago, they were not AWS. <coughs> et les sites web que nous, que nous mettions à disposition avaient beaucoup de problèmes de lenteur et de, et de, uh, de scalabilité. And so every website and application was very slow, and, and it, it didn't help in giving the, the good experience to the customer. Un, un de nos brillants ingénieurs a eu l'idée d'aller sur AWS, et du jour au lendemain, les produits numériques se sont accélérés chez Radio France. So one, one guy in his team uh, had the idea to switch and to go to cloud, which uh, at, at this point made them go very um, <coughs> quicker in the way they delivered products. Qui nous permet maintenant d'être, uh, de pouvoir non pas concurrencer le hertzien, mais d'être un, un nouveau relais de la diffusion, uh, de notre diffusion, de notre mission de service public. So from the paradigm to become a competitor to hertzian um, uh, way, they just switched and, and created a new brand and a new um, product line on the side that is not competing, but living its own life. Et cela s'est fait sans, uh, on a monté une spin-off technique et, et, et numérique, on n'a pas pu embarquer les équipes techniques euh, historiques euh, du fait que c'est pas le même métier. So they had to create a company within the company that's fully digital because the switch between the old way of doing it to the new way was too hard, too big, and so they, they created a brand within a uh, company within Radio France that only does full digital with their own marketing. Uh, Jennifer, I know you are in the in the probably in the throes of the sort of transformation of uh, how, how consumers and citizens want to consume education and um, you know, the demands of uh, the, the Gen Z and, uh, and millennials on, 
um, how they consume things. Um, how has that impacted your transformation? I know you guys have been a, a leader for, for quite some time, but how has that um, you know, pushed you or, or made you think about how you uh, take on new technology challenges? Well, we talk a lot about uh, envisioning the art of the possible, and we talk a lot about violating our assumptions. And what's really exciting about the whole AWS suite of products, and I'll, I'll break down some of the ways we're looking at it, it is a full-scale change, as we've been talking about here. It is, you know, all three layers, the people, the processes, and then the technology, not the technology first. But what that really looks like, it's, uh, it's much like uh, what uh, Jean-Marie described at Radio France, in that previously, the reason Athabasca University, as 100% online, only had approximately 40,000 students was not a marketing issue. It was that we were serving out of a pipe from a server closet in the county of Athabasca, Alberta. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, go figure. So <laughs> one of the easiest things to do, and, and of course I, I use the word easy as only someone in my position would, which where we all cackle and laugh hysterically every time somebody <laughs> says that, is that we took all of the courses and we put them into the cloud. Okay, so that's over 850 different courses. And so you start there, but then from that it becomes really exciting because first of all, those courses right now are traditional asynchronous, mostly textually based. That's an advantage in that now we can put uh, some of the machine learning uh, comprehension recognition from AWS onto the content set itself so that we can deconstruct and reconstruct the learning offerings to move from a just-in-case type of learning where you have to take a whole degree to a just-in-time type of learning model of what are the 10 to 20 minutes of a key uh, piece of information that I need to know. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that I would say is that the revolution is starts from within. Everyone has to get training, and I mean everybody, all the executive team, myself included. So I've just come off of two weeks with my whole team taking AWS business essentials, technical essentials, the solutions architecture, and the exam prep, although I gotta study some more before I can pass because I'm, I'm old. <laughs> um, but we're all taking it together and we're in there together. Um, that is so important because as soon as everyone starts the training, all that worry about, oh my God, I'm a systems admin, I, I'm not gonna have a gig anymore, it just goes completely away because you see all of the art of the possible of what you're now going to be able to do that you couldn't do before. But I think training is key because training is the wedge to get people into um, seeing the real deal with what you can do with AWS. I mean, I came, I came back from my first day of Tech Essentials in the first lab that I did there, and I was talking to my husband about it, and I, I almost wept because what took me at the most high-powered Wall Street firm where I had every bit of dollar at my resources in the 90s would still take me and my team two weeks to go from bare metal to existing uh, infrastructure that we needed for what we were doing. It, I literally did it in 10 minutes. Like, I created everything I needed for a multi-region, multi-availability zone, put my VPCs up, put my, you know, all the infrastructure up that I needed. And to have that gift is so liberating that I think that's the key is you get everybody in there in the training. So to your point about it's very new for us mm -hmm. too, one of the things that we just did last week is now we started to go beyond just what we will know. And I think if you're more um, used to the old world of, of running tech shops, you're gonna start with you know, your EC2 instances and your classic you know, relational database structures, Amazon RDS, or I mean you can bring your licenses and it's, it's the managed services stack is, is really, really impressive. But when we get our professors and our computer scientists, we can get them going right with, with the, um, the Lambda and the DynamoDB, the kinds of things that are super flexible and they don't necessarily need us in IT to always set it up for them. That's a very important piece of what we do as a research university. All of our professors, no matter what they teach, they're online doing it. And so now, just last week, we started talking about, okay, how about high-performance computing? How do we utilize that in a way that our professors can work with the grad students in the AWS sandboxes themselves to do data analysis and understand and learn this? So you see where this is going. Now I'm gonna graduate those people. They're in Western Canada. We start to diversify our economy, that you start all the way back with training as yourself, the VPI, TCIO, and all of the folks around you, whether they're business operations, um, academic, or technical. Uh, within. So I can talk more about some of the HPC work we're doing too if that's of interest later. Yeah. 
Um, I, I'm really interested in one of the things you were saying about how um, once people get their hands on the technology and they really understand it, they, their anxiety starts to uh, dissipate a little bit about, oh no, you know, my job's going to go away. I'm, I'm interested in whether any of the other folks here have had that experience of, um, you know, that hurdle of anxiety from staff of like, oh, this is a new thing and it's, it's you know, I'm, I'm, my job might disappear here. And, Test your yeah. nodding. <laughs> so um, we've just introduced site reliability engineering. So we've, we're going through some organisational change and around how we deliver services. Um, and again, supporting that transition, that 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 journey we're taking to move to um, to hyperscale public cloud. Um, so site reliability engineering. How can we help uh, colleagues to, to 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 be trained, to be able to support and understand? Um, how to move to a DevOps culture, but also the skills needed to support that. Amazon has done a fantastic job helping support us in getting our, getting our colleagues trained and will continue to do that. It, it is back down to, as, as Jennifer said, we've got to look at how we can help everyone to adapt to that change, um, to then be able to support um, and give them confidence. Uh, we've, we've had a number of, um, a number of colleagues who've just uh, move from infrastructure engineering, traditional network roles, who are interested in developing their skills, um, and, and database management, and actually seeing some of the services that are available on, on, on AWS, um, enables them to get that confidence and through the training to be able to understand mm -hmm. um, how they can um, become more part of the journey that we're taking. Mm -hmm. Jean-Marie, do you have any? We have considered, as I said, we have built a spin-off. So we have done it without the existing teams. So you started from scratch. They, they choose to create a spin-off in Radio France without using the whole stack, and they created from scratch. Cependant, la, la, les, les données, nous les récupérons d'un système d'information ancien. So the, um, the data they use still comes from the old system, so they have to integrate it with. Et cette intégration uh, uh, par uh, capillarité, <laughs> par capillarité, uh, en montrant l'exemple uh, de, de, de ce que nous étions capables de faire a permis de susciter l'intérêt de la part des organisations historiques. So I'm not able to translate that, but what he says is that they couldn't do it um, uh, in, in a, a role project very fast. So what they did is that they, they, they break down in very small pieces and they try to show it was possible by doing it step by step and, and minimizing the steps. Et pour l'heure, uh, les équipes historiques ont compris l'intérêt de faire du cloud et sont désormais dans les mains d'Alex qui euh, organise des trainings pour eux. So the way the, the way it worked is that once the the old team uh, the legacy team saw that they were able to deliver much quicker and be very happy about their stack in the cloud and be secure and everything they start working with us um, to um, adapt cloud in their old uh, IT legacy system. So I'm going to go just a bit beyond that, what Jean-Marie just said because um, I work with them on a daily basis. What happened is that for now, the, the IT system is, is very old and some of the technology is not even virtualized. So there is some problems to go to the cloud. But what we, what we discovered is that by uh, working on the security and the network, there is a lot of aspects that can be uh, break down kind of easily and make very quick wins that allows you to go faster. And Next year, there, there'll probably go. Um, there'll probably be a lot of workshops and training for the Radio France legacy team in order to make them adopt cloud faster. So it, it, it goes aligned with what you said. Yeah. Um, Peter, I know uh, that that um, you've had to overcome obstacles and and you know, change how you how you do things internally. Um, you know, partially on the workforce front, but other things as well. I'm interested to hear from you and then and from anyone else who'd like to join in. Um, obstacles that you have had to overcome or things that you wish you would have known okay. in advance or that you would have done differently? Sure, yeah. I think to have a sustainable digital transformation change, there are a few aspects. One aspect is that the, 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 the digital transformation cannot stand alone. You have to link back to the business strategy. So in our case, we have a, a long-term ma transport master plan for 2014. This is currently a, a big policy change a plan for us. And looking at the future of Singapore, for example, looking at car light to pushing uh, more less on public, trans public transport and more to public transport. And to support that, then we have two other plans to support that business strategy. One is the organization, organization level digital transformation plan. One is the industry uh, transformation map. Now these two plans then help to support that 
um, organization strategy by making use of technology and, and digital uh, advancement. Um, and second aspect of this is that the, about um, the culture change. Um, people don't re really receive change. They receive change because they firstly, they don't understand what's the purpose, and secondly, they are, they, they are not understand how, what is our role and how can they be part of the, the change. So we did a number of things because to have that lasting um, change at an organization level, you need to involve many people. Most of the people in the organization had to be um, involved in some way. So um, we did a number of things. Just for example, um, we have a, a data science team in the organization. This uh, is a small group of people, about 15 of them, and they're supporting an organization of about 7,000 people. But in order to have that digital transformation where we see data as a very important part, we need to more people to understand about data, about data science, about data analysis. So we have a very comprehensive uh, training program. The objective is to really bring the entire organization to be a uh, data-driven um, and build up the data analysis capability. So we are started a program to actually build up the capability of the engineers at organization level. So we have started four runs now, and the plan is to really train out the 4,000 engineers and professional in the organization so they become equipped themselves with this uh, knowledge and they, they can be also be part of this uh, digital transformation journey. So this is one of the things we have done. Mm -hmm. Any, anyone else who has sort of something they wish that the advice they would give to someone who's starting on their journey or something that you wish you would have uh, known in advance or done? I think. Uh, for, for, for me, certainly, and, and for our organization, um, we, we always talk about engagement. And engagement, you can never have enough. Um, so I look back at the last 18 months, and we focused on lots of work streams around, Jennifer mentioned people and culture, kind of process, and, mm -hmm. and all of the technical aspects. And we accelerated the technical aspects to really give that platform to help our uh, application teams to be able to on board. But actually, we needed to focus at the same time and as much um, as much velocity around some of the other process and some of the other people aspects and culture um, I don't think we've got blockers but every day we have to continue to work with varied uh, colleagues it's not it's not just about security that always gets mentioned it's not about um, some of the process and service side it's across even technical colleagues so we'll have our developers who will say, well, we want to be able to use this service and another set of developers that want something else and another set over there that want something else. So how do we really build a reusable uh, set of products for our application teams to be able to use with different use cases and different requirements? So it is that constant engagement and the, the, the better we do that, the, the, more, uh, the more quality we have in terms of our requirements and everyone's quite clear on that journey as Peter mentioned. Um, and, and so that's been really, really key. We really still need to do more. Mm -hmm. um, Jennifer, I know you, you mentioned your use of machine learning and yep. some other advanced services. I'd love to hear a little bit more about some of the impact on students from the use of those services. So well, it'll come. Uh, it's not there yet, the okay. use of the services for the students. But what we are doing with our students, for instance, is they're also going to get AWS credits, all of them. And of course, we're accrediting as a university, right, which we're accredit, uh, accredit authority is given to us in Canada, but in our case, by the government of Alberta. We're also an accredited university in the United States through middle states. So we are co-creating with the AWS team then those concepts that the students are not just going to get the technical training, but they're also going to get the broader approach to leadership within data analytics or um, data mining, big data, as we were talking about uh, from my colleagues here, all wrapped into, and now go do it. So uh, we're, <laughs> in our province, we always say get her done. And, and that's what it's about, right? It's like learn it, apply it, learn it, apply it, and keep repeating. And then AWS works so beautifully in there because they keep coming out with new things to learn and apply. So specifically, as it relates to some of the work that will be coming, um, when we look at our researchers, uh, I'm sure many of you know who support uh, researchers of different kinds, that they often are using their grants through, and sometimes they get free services from their country, it depends. Uh, sometimes they get services, but only if it's pure research, not if it's applied, or something that could look commercial in nature, and so you have this gap uh, where you really could have some interesting stuff happening. So we've got folks that um, are, are doing the kinds of things that we'll use 
um, Pali, Lex, and Sumerian. Sumerian is very uh, attractive to many of our professors because they're thinking of the pedagogical supports of virtual agents that help with the online learning. And Pali and Lex are very interesting to us and we're keeping a, an eye out on what the um, automotive in industry is doing because we drive everywhere in, up north. Like we are, I mean, you know, watchers on the wall, like that's up. Like we're just <laughs> all over the place with the snow and everything. And so the idea that you could be in, in your um, SUV going down, you know, Highway 2 or whatever, hey Alexa, you know, tell me, uh, quiz me on chapter 13 of, you know, Accounting 101 and you're just having that back and forth. I mean, it's way more interesting than talking to Siri, for sure, plus it works you towards uh, whatever your learning objective is. So, um, but to get a little bit more specific, to give people some ideas of some of the work we're doing up there, our researchers are working on, um, this is using the high performance uh, uh, computing offering that AWS is introducing to us. We also wanna use, and I was in the last session, the Snowball Edges because our, our big mission as, as Canada's only online university is you get to learn where you live. You do not have to uproot your family, your culture, and move out of your community. We have a lot of indigenous communities. We have a lot of farmers. It's important for them to be able to get a university education in place. And in some of those places, we don't have the connectivity that, uh, that a lot of other countries have up in the north yet. Um, and so we have to go out there with the university itself. So looking at even that new release last night on the Snowball Edge is really important to us because that's what we want to do. We want to be able to put those edges into the um, communities themselves and still have people be able to access that. Right now they drive up to parking lots of whoever's got the strongest wireless and just try to, try to exist. I mean, it's a, it's a different culture. Mm -hmm. So to get back to the researchers though, so Autonomous Longitudinal Observational Studies in English, uh, which is uh, writing analytics and coding analytics using HPC and the ML um, tool sets for that. Uh, I talked about the interactions between the virtual pedagogical agents and online learners themselves, and then you can, that's also a continuous loop of improvement and uh, research interfacing. Using du uh, digital musical instruments as an interface to create architectural environments in virtual reality. Um, that's, uh, we've got a whole architecture practice that's looking at that. And then augmented reality of archeological digs. There's been some work on that done already, but the ability again, to be at the edge of the dig, which can be anywhere, and have that be useful to other people studying the site uh, is, is very important. So those are just some examples of some of the work that uh, we're hoping to continue to use new iterations as soon as they come out and uh, get them into the hands of our researchers and our professors. It's, uh, it's so uh, interesting what you're, the way that you're talking about sort of your vision for helping to transform the workforce, um, not, not only in, in your own region, but sort of across uh, Canada and, and in other parts of the world. I, I think that's a, one of the really transformative effects of, of working with the cloud is that you can have um, employees who are working in different places, who are learning in different places. I'm wondering if any of you have experienced that kind of flexibility or that um, you know ability to reach out to get talent from um, a broader set of folks, um, you know, or uh, new people coming in as you've expanded in your cloud journey. Any? Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, John. <coughs> À partir du moment où la, la technique, enfin, des, des solutions, euh, des solutions comme AWS euh, vous permettent de plus être limité par la technique. So it, the thing is, AWS frees you from um, any technical pro, um, uh, lim, limitation. Mm -hmm. Et à partir de là commence la créativité. So that's that's when you can become creative because the, the technical stack is not a problem anymore. Oui. Dans, 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 dans notre cas, chez Radio France, euh, on peut désormais mettre à disposition du public, donc nos clients, nos archives, notre trésor. So Radio France is 60 years old, so they have a very, very big archives of lots of songs, lots of uh, uh, audio uh, streaming that, that is very rich. And the, when they switched to cloud, they were able to um, um, give access to, their, to, to all the customers, to the, all the listeners in France, to those, to those archives, which was not possible before because of technical limitations. On peut s'insérer très simplement dans Alexa pour pouvoir mettre à disposition du grand public 
des flash info, l'information du podcast. They are able to integrate with Alexa, for instance, to give access to podcast information, news, and archives. On peut ré, on, on travaille à, à faire du, du speech to text de l'ensemble de nos archives pour pouvoir les traduire et les mettre à disposition des Français mais du reste du monde. The next big thing is to um, use speech to text technology to transform all these 60 years of data in order to make them accessible online with text and also worldwide uh, by translating it automatically for everybody. Un, un de nos métiers, c'est de mettre, de, fa de créer des radios musicales euh, et de, fa de fabriquer des web radios. Euh, des solutions comme, euh, on réfléchit à des solutions comme Elemental pour pouvoir faciliter l'envoi euh, des web radios vers le grand public en garantissant d'avoir un haut une haute qualité d'écoute. One of the job of Radio France is to create uh, web radios. So with the new te Elemental technology, they are thinking about creating channels and turn, and turn them turn them down when it's not needed anymore. And so that's very um, powerful because they don't have to invest a lot in order to create a web station or a web radio. They can just use what they need and when, it, when en fait, it's done. Uh, Amazon or the cloud in general uh, gives us uh, all the keys to become people creative. So the, the, for him, the AWS cloud is really the, the, the way to empower people and let them become creative with no constraint of IT. Yeah. Um, and it sounds like Uh, the move to the cloud has really been a big part of your future vision for Radio France, right? Um, I'm, I'm interested in if you have a thought about where you're headed next or where, where this cloud journey might take Radio France next. Uh, we have many next steps. We have a lot, a lot, a lot of new steps. The steps are to pouvoir, for example, uh, mettre à disposition des radios sur la côte américaine, enfin en Amérique, euh, des radios qui viennent de, qui sont fabriquées par nos programmateurs et qui, je pense, plairont beaucoup euh, ici. So no, there is a lot of next step. One of one of them is to um, be to be able to to serve also the American people with the French content. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a French uh, cultural exception that is very liked abroad, and so uh, being able to put that in in the hands of Um, America would be a very good stuff. Et une autre, enfin, euh, c'est surtout en fait de révéler les archives, d'aller chercher les archives euh, et de pouvoir euh, de pouvoir accompagner les, le public dans le savoir, dans la culture, de connaître son époque en regardant l'époque d'avant avec des vrais témoignages euh, enregistrés. So, the next, the next thing is really to work on the archives, to to extract every metadata, every information that's based, that's con contained in in these archives. which is very rich because Um, with the six years of, of, of audio that they have, they can help you understand the, the, the different um, stage which France was, the history, each, um, um, almost each subject has a very deep knowledge based in, in the Radio France Archive that they can extract, and maybe one step would be to put that um, uh, content available to people enriched by information so you can search, for instance, in a period of the history to know more or um, a place in Paris or something like that. Un concert des Stones. Or a Stones concert. Enregistrer la maison de la radio, les Beatles, enfin, aller chercher. C'est tout ce qu'on a, on a un trésor. Donc on va aller chercher. It's a real treasure that they, they want to expose to everybody because the, 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 the headquarters of Radio France are a very known place in France. It's a, um, it, it's a very famous place where a lot of um, bands and, and, and celebrities were, uh, performed, so they also have those uh, archives and they can put a Rolling Stones concert available to everyone, mm -hmm. for instance. That's awesome. Um, Peter, I know that you, uh, you've thought about how digital transformation will um, drive the Land Transport Authority in the future. What, mm -hmm. is, what are you thinking about as far as where that will take you next? Yeah. Um, okay, at a Singapore level, we have a Smart Nation uh, initiative. And under that, there are three key pillars. One is called Digital Government Initiative. One is the digital economy, and one is the digital lifestyle. So LTA is a one of the government agency, and so we are working very closely with the other agency to look at this digital government uh, blueprint. So for us, I think the digital transformation will have these few important digital outcomes. One is to the customers and the public interacting with us. We want to create that digital experience, which means end-to-end -end, um, digital services, 100% uh, e-payment, 
um, so that they can, they can carry out their, their daily function much easier when they interact with government. And, and we also want the service to be of good standard. We are now bench benchmarking with a uh, very good company. Maybe the services that citizens will be enjoying from Amazon, from Google, from, from Apple. So we are benchmarking that the, the quality of services we provide should be on par or we want to learn from this, uh, this company. Second aspect is for the internal um, uh, uh, employee, the 7,000 employee with land transfer authority. We want to empower them digitally. That means we want them to access to all the information, all the documents digitally. They can work anywhere. They, they will find that they are equipped digitally to be able to also carry out their work uh, and become part of the journey of this bigger digital transformation. So there's a lot of work to be done in there because we're talking about changing mindset, changing culture, changing business processes. So in fact, the second pillar is, a, is a very, something easy to say, but very hard to do. And the third part is really to be prepared, LTA, to be digitally for the future. So there's a lot of, um, because land transport is a very long journey. When you build a route or build a railway, it, it, it takes years to happen, five years, 10 years, 15 years. But we need to have a two-speed organization. They need to be a part of an organization that's very limber, that's able to innovate very fast. And certainly, the, the overall cloud strategy will help us to uh, be able to achieve that, to help us to be one step closer. So we see the cloud um, strategy as a very important enabler <laughs> to help us to uh, achieve this digital outcome. Um, Ditesh, what about you? you? What do you see coming next for uh, So I think journey? we've we've achieved um, quite a lot. We're not looking at dev and test now. It's, mm -hmm. It is the norm, absolutely, and we are putting some really good um, really critical services to, to, uh, to citizens and internally for our own uh, colleagues onto, um, onto AWS and, and hyperscale public cloud. I think mean, next is around, uh, we're doing some great work with our partner organizations, AWS partners, around how we can start to transform um, our services and move them and re architect, refactor those to public cloud. But actually, we, we need to look at sustainability around what we can do around building our own internal capability, around having um, the right uh, support from our talented uh, colleagues and, and helping them to develop. So really it's around, first of all, helping to build that sustainable organization so um, that we can take all of our workforce along on the journey. The second part is around, um, as I mentioned before, making sure we can build those reusable products that can then just help that innovation at scale, just help to roll out those applications much quicker. Um, and that's that's going to take. Um, that's going to be a continuous uh, work that we have to do across all our teams um, through engagement. And as we do that, we'll then be able to move more and more and get that that agility across everything we do. Mm -hmm. and, and what about you? You've talked a little bit about your the future of Athabasca. What, what's what's next? Well, we have a we have a big, hairy, audacious goal, uh, BHAG, mm -hmm. and it's really focused around the redefinition of the learner. So for us, our learners now are ages 14 through the dual credit programs that we have with our high schools in Alberta, all the way up to 99 and beyond, and as long as people will live. So imagine having to have that continuous relationship 14 to 99 and beyond. So as we stack our understanding, our implementation of all the different AWS offerings and, and other things that we're creating, our, this is our BHAG, it's um, the creation of an Athabasca University augmented intelligence learning partner who's your mentor or your coach, your companion in learning for your lifetime, right? And that's the AWS part, but the Amazon part is then, they're powered by AWS machine learning, so it's in your car, like I talked about, on your Kindle, listening from your Echo, present wherever you are. Um, it's not science fiction anymore, it's achievable. It's a heck of a lot of data uh, aggregation into the right kind of data lake uh, so that learners at scale can learn about themselves, and that's what it is. So the whole platform, function as a service, network as a service, platform as a service, will evolve to create that augmented intelligence learning partner that is supplementary to the human interactions that you have, but always allows you to know where are you in that piece of learning. How close are you to mastery? What level are you at? In a, in a quantifiable, pedagogical way that comes from our learning professors themselves. 
So that's the BHAG. It's not going to happen next year for sure, but that's what we're working towards. We've got our eyes on the prize in the next five to ten years to get that really solid. Um, I have a question for each of the panelists. So um, I think that public sector organizations get kind of a bad rap for being, um, you know, slow and anxious and, um, you know, uh, sort of too cautious. And, you know, obviously you guys are great examples from across the world of public sector organizations that have embraced change. I'm interested to hear from each of you what you think it was in your organization um, or, you know, in your teams that has helped to motivate your teams and make you kind of, you know, leaders and innovators. You want to start? Well, I, I would uh, credit partially our provincial government who has invested in this dream with us. Uh, we couldn't do it without them. And in Canada, Alberta, we're known as the Mavericks. We are out there. Uh, we've got partners in, at the University of Alberta who are at the very leading edge of reinforcement learning, which is a, a piece of AI. And we've got an incredibly talented workforce that comes from a really significantly world-class K through 12 sector. So our partners in the K through 12 sector are producing um, citizens with a great aptitude for applied technological um, prowess, and we continue to move that forward. But it's, it's a shared effort across our universities, across our public sector, across our government, and absolutely with our startup culture and our industry partners as well. Okay. Yeah, so I think um, one of the um, great things that UK government did do is, is talk about cloud first a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. So taking that and setting that direction um, has really helped. There's introduction of commercial frameworks or G Cloud. Um, so that really helped to, to start the journey and, and push things um, to making it the norm. So public sector shouldn't really feel, um, especially in UK government, that um, all UK public sector, that it's, 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 we, we can't use cloud and we shouldn't move, move to cloud. Um, and that, that's been a really key change a number of years ago. And each organization has to deal with their own challenges. Again, as Jennifer said, we have a fantastic um, set of talent. We've uh, brought in some additional support through, um, through additional developers. And that, that, that helps to start to, um, to create, as we've got this bimodal approach at the moment of an agile and waterfall as we start to reimagine in our applications and how we're going to transform them, start to really help to uh, change the culture of the organization and start to think, right, we can innovate much quicker, we can deliver things uh, much better. So I think there's a composite of how we operate in, in, in UK, the public sector is, and, and that, that kind of support from the top and having the commercial arrangements and framework around that. The National Cyber Security Center in the UK um, is, is a really good e exemplar of, of how having that um, additional focus around security and around how we should look at security in um, around cloud and what we should be considering thinking about it um, what we should be uh, applying as part of our delivery around security um, so that's really helped to try and build the foundations for us to then accelerate mm -hmm. um, <coughs> première des choses uh, en tant que service public se rapprocher de son service achat quand on veut acheter du cloud. So the first thing you want to do when you're a public sector company is to talk to your purchasing department. <laughs> Le deuxième des choses vis-à-vis -vis de ces équipes, euh, c'est euh, de changer un peu la, de transformer euh, l'engagement, d'être sur un engagement d'équipe et pas sur une sur une, un modèle de management historique. So you also have to switch the way you manage people. You have to empower uh, everyone of your team to become a builder and let them go freely instead of having a really uh, old method of management which is imposing stuff. Especially in France. And it's particularly true in France. The third thing is to cultivate the de cultiver la non pas la haine de de ne de ne pas aimer le legacy de combattre quotidiennement le legacy. So you also have to foster a culture of hating legacy. <laughs> et, et de de systématiquement se poser la question comment je pourrais faire autrement. Qu'est-ce que euh, de, de quelle manière l'équipe pourrait ensemble penser une autre manière de traiter ce legacy. Mm -hmm. And, and, and you also have to foster this culture of 
um, always think about how can I do it, uh, how can I do things differently, not challenge regularly the statu quo to develop the product. Et euh, dernière des, dernière des choses, euh, leur donner des, de la, leur donner de la, de la matière technologique. Euh, euh, nous, on utilise Kubernetes. Euh, C'est une technologie qui a permis de vraiment d'embarquer nos, nos équipes d'infrastructures euh, en leur donnant des repères, euh, un peu les, dans leur, ils vont se retrouver leurs repères historiques au travers de Kubernetes. So the last thing is also to feed the people with technological innovation. Uh, the full stack of, of Radio France is Kubernetes, which um, lead the, his team to uh, rethink the way they, they, they were doing IT and, and to get them closer from their job with technical innovation and technical um, um, in, interesting stuff to do. Cultiver l'amour de, de la technologie uh, en, en bannissant le maximum de la legacy. <laughs> Sorry. To foster love about new technology and fight the legacy. <laughs> Merci. <laughs> bon. um, Peter? Yes. Um, I, I think the two critical success factors for us is one is leadership and second is policy. Uh, we are fortunate to have a politician as well as public sector leaders who understand technology, who see the potential of technology and digital services that can actually help to um, enhance the competitiveness of Singapore economy, as well as providing better quality uh, public services. Um, so we have a lot of support from the leadership uh, perspective. Second part is policy review. I think um, at the government sector, policy become very important element for us to decide what we can do, what we cannot do. I'm very glad that I think in recent years, we have um, made the policy very flexible. In fact, we have a commercial, now a commercial cloud first uh, implementation strategy. And we are also reviewing the security policy to make so that we are able to make a lot more flexible in making use of cloud technology and yet fulfill many of the uh, compliant requirements. So those factors have helped a lot in driving this wave of uh, digital transformation as well as making full use of the cloud as a potential enabler. All right, well, uh, I'd love to get a round of applause for this set of public sector innovators. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here, and uh, thanks. Have a great conference. And Angel, do you have, do you have the inv invites, the postcards? All right, so if you want an invite to our public sector reception, go see Angela right here in the front row. Thank you. <laughs>